you know, as a young chef, when cooks would come in and they'd be interviewing for a job and they'd say, Chef, I have this pasta dish I was thinking of making you to show you what a good cook I am. I really like the job. What can I do? What can I do to show you? I'd say, you know what? Go into the kitchen and you make me the best soup that you think I should be eating today. Now, soup cooking, soup cookery is a test of a really wonderful cook and it's all about technique. I have two techniques for two soups today, a beautiful, right, the height of summer corn soup that we're also going to turn into a sauce with some sautéed scallops that's incredible and a roasted butternut squash with apples that's like a hug inside your stomach. One taste of this, mmm, and you'll see why soups are so important to me. Michael Chiarella's Napa is funded by Salton, innovative products for a healthy today and tomorrow. Featuring a full line of Breadman machines to make artisan breads for use in your own home. Salton, we'll bring out the baker in you. By Sunkist, fresh citrus taste, cooking with Sunkist throughout the day. Sunkist. Our promise, your inspiration. By All Clad Metal Crafters. All Clad is bonded construction. All Clad is functional design. All Clad is professional equipment. All Clad is a state of mind. And by Wolf, makers of ovens, cooktops, and ranges to fuel a passion for cooking. When I think about my 13th year as a young teenager and a young man, what I think about is August 10th, right? 20 days left before school starts, corn as far as you can see. We used to cruise the canal banks with our fishing poles looking for where the bass were biting. But as soon as the sun would go down and the inversion would happen, you'd smell corn forever. When we were eight and nine years old, we'd play hide and seek in the corn and you get lost for hours in there. The stickiness and the smell of the corn and the delicateness of the flavor is something that's really unique. I'm gonna show you a couple ways to grab the flavor of the corn really gently and do something that's gonna fit the day so perfectly. When you think about fresh corn, right, corn as a raw vegetable is really wonderful, just like peas can be. How do you know when corn's fresh enough to eat raw or when you should be really cooking these delicate dishes? It's really simple. You grab your thumb and you press down right on a piece of the corn and that's it right there. You see that? When that shoots out and the, and the corn's that milky, that's the flavor that we want. Now I'm gonna show you how to do a corn soup. And it's not just a soup. The first job I had as a young cook was as a saucier. Now a saucier's job was to make all of the sauces for the kitchen, all of the stocks, everything that got, that, that got ladled and soups are part of what we did. One of the tricks that I learned early on is a really great soup can make a fantastic sauce, right? But first off, you have to know how to make great soups. Now, soups aren't easy to make. People either underthink them or overthink them and get the flavors really muddy. We have a primary ingredient, a secondary ingredient, and just a couple of supporting flavors, especially remember the corn is really delicate. So what we're gonna do, is we're gonna take the corn off the cob, you stand it up, and off they go, and the corn comes off. Look at, look at my knife, you see all the milk right there? That's when you know it's time to make a little corn soup. Take the back of my knife because in this corn there's all of that flavor as well. We want that for the soup. So you have the corn cobs, and this is just like making a chicken broth, only these are your chicken bones, kind of vegetable bones, if you will. Corn cobs go into some good water. Good water meaning that if you don't have good water where you are, this would be one of those times that you'd spend 79 cents for a couple quarts of water that's of really good quality. We're going to take a couple stalks of celery, okay? We're going to take one yellow onion and just pull them apart. And any other aromatics that you like, really. Now, I like bay leaf. And bay leaf's one of those things I think people don't grow anymore. And I don't know why we don't grow it. It's the easiest thing. It's like an olive tree. It's a weed. They grow from year to year. They, I think you can grow them from Minnesota to, to South Florida. 
That's what a bay leaf looks like fresh. And every time you pick a leaf, if you look really closely here, you see if I pick this leaf, there's another leaf ready to come. Fresh bay leaves are spectacular. You can use dried, but this is like no big deal. Okay, so a couple bay leaves go in. I'm going to season this with a little bit of salt. These are going to simmer for about 15 minutes. No more than that. When you're doing fish stocks and vegetable stocks, these flavors are very delicate. What we're trying to harness is the freshness of the corn flavor. And when they're done, they look like this one I have here already. What we have is a delicate clear broth. I'm just going to check for seasoning. Wow. Oh. The taste of the corn first and the vegetables up underneath it is really fantastic. Now all you do is take the uh, corn cobs out. Now we're going to add most of the corn right in. Most of the corn because this is going to simmer for just a minute. Let the corn simmer just enough. We're going to add a little bit of cream. Now you don't need to add cream, but you can use buttermilk, non-fat, no cream at all. I like just a touch. Just a touch in there. All right, and I'm going to add a pinch of oregano. You don't have to. You can use any herb that you have. I like, in the summertime, I like the herb freshness right at the end. So I, not, I wouldn't put this in early. Just before I puree it, a little bit of oregano goes in. Now all the vegetables go in because everything is going to puree. So don't take all the time doing all this fancy knife work. It's all going to get pureed wonderfully smooth. Ah, oh, that is just unbelievable. Now, I'm going to strain this just a little bit. No matter how fresh the corn is, the corn skin has a little bit of a texture to it. And because I'm going to use this a couple of different ways, we want to get rid of it. So it's going to go quickly through a strainer. Things always strain faster when they're warm. So if you're going to make this ahead, at least go through the straining process. You'll get it through easier. Now, look at this. You will now see a spectacular soup. You see how creamy that is? To turn this into an entree. Mmm, God, that's so good. I'm going to add the fresh corn into the soup, and that's just going to steep. I add the fresh corn now so I have a little bit of texture. You know, that's kind of a chef trick that. If you're going to use corn, you let people know corn. That way, if you don't see it sometimes, you don't immediately recognize it. It doesn't taste as good because you're kind of searching around for the flavor. These are called day boat scallops. Why? Because the boat goes out for one day and she comes back and they're really fresh and wonderful. Now, I'm going to season those with a little bit of toasted fennel spice. All I've done is taken some fennel seeds and some coriander seeds and a little bit of white pepper, toasted them up in a saute pan and put them in the blender and pureed them. And I love this flavor, especially with corn. All right, these go in, a little bit of salt. Now my pan is hot. When you have a really great scallop, you want to cook them medium rare. Olive oil goes in. Again, if you're putting something in the pan, set it in the pan. If you set it in the pan, you might burn yourself. If you drop it in the pan, for sure you're going to burn yourself, or worse yet, you're going to burn a guest. Scallops, because they're so rich, could be seared ahead a little bit. So before your guests were coming, you would have this corn soup slash sauce already good to go. The scallops seared rare, your oven on about 425 degrees in a little, in a little oven going pan. It's time to sit down. What do you do? You heat up the soup a little bit, scallops go in the oven to heat through, and you finish it. It is really that simple. While those are searing, I'm going to plate this soup. Look at that. Now there's a million different things you can do to this. You can add things, if you like southwestern foods, you can add a little uh, picante sauce or a roasted pepper puree. Those are just incredible. Now they're finish that off, I'm going to grab a couple fresh chives, some very high-tech kitchen <laughs> scissors, chives go in. Chives and corn are like cousins, I think. A little bit of 
basil infused olive oil, drizzled over the top. The olive oil and the basil flavor, when it hits the warm soup, the fragrance will come right up past your guests. It'll really blow their mind. Now you hear that? You hear the scallop? I'm not hearing a lot of water coming out of the scallop. That's telling me that the scallop is ready for turning, that they're beginning to release enough water. And you see that? That caramelization equals flavor. When you're doing foods that are this simple, you have to rely on good technique. Technique is what you should have in the tool belt of a good cook. Technique that we really rely on to do things that are really wonderful. Okay, now to turn this into a sauce, it's really that simple. You don't have to stick in it. You don't have to do anything else at all. It goes down in a soup plate like this. These scallops go right in the middle. And now I have a little bunch of watercress. Anything at all will do. I love watercress. It's a little contrast to the sweetness and the richness. You have something that's a little peppery. And you take a little tuft and in they go. On top of that, a drizzle of some basil oil. Uh, a little dusting of the fennel spice. That's, now that's cooking. Now as a chef, we learn how to take one technique and turn it into a whole bunch of different things. Now with corn soup, you understand you can make a wonderful soup. You can turn that same soup, right, into a sauce for an entree like this. You can add a couple of potatoes, a slice of bacon, and before you know it's a chowder, right? So don't be so freaked out about what's the final recipe that you learn. Learn the techniques, and from those techniques, you'll get a myriad of dishes. You know, for us that live in California, we have no concept of what fall really can feel like. I used to live in the Northeast for a long time, and the turning of the leaves in upstate New York was just, just an event in itself. It was an experience that you waited for, like the first asparagus in Southern California. Not just the, the turning of the color of the leaves, but the piles of leaves and the kids going through them and leaves burning and all of that. You see where I'm getting with this? There's a time of the year that's experiential. And there's foods that go with that same experience. You know, I love to make soups. And I love to make soups that when you walk in your house, everybody says, Oh my God, they get a hug inside their body. And that's what a great soup can do. Now squash is one of my favorite, favorite soups of all time. And not zucchini squash or patty pan. I'm talking butternut squash, uh, blue hubbard squash, acorn. I love those to death because you can, they store all winter long. So you can buy 50 pounds of them. They last you the entire winter in a root cellar. And they're really easy to make. Now the soup I'm gonna make today is a little bit more like a bisque. Now what a bisque is is something that's rich and intense and has a, an, is an entree onto itself. If you have a shrimp or a lobster bisque, that is a meal to me. Now we're going to start with some leeks. All we're going to do is cut the root section off of this. Now if you don't have any leeks, you can use onions. I don't use all of the green because these get a little bit muddy inside here. We're going to cut these in half. We're going to check and see if they're clean. You just open them up like a deck of cards. If they're clean on the inside, we're going to give them a quick chop. Now because it's, you know, 39 degrees outside, and I'm going to use a little bit of butter instead of olive oil here, because I like when the butter gets nutty. And when it actually foams, the French say that it noisettes. So the butter's going to go in. Now the butternut squash, what you use is a potato peeler to peel these. And you just peel them down like I have here. They're really no big deal. Again, these are very firm. All right, so take a big knife and use it deliberately. Lean up a little bit, use your entire body. You see how I have my shoulder locked, right? And use your body to help you a little bit. I'm just gonna dice these up. Now if you look back into my pot, I don't hear the butter, right? So that I know that it's brown already. See that? The leek goes in. Ah, oh, that butter. Whew! That's fantastic. It's like hazelnuts. The garlic goes in. And those are going to sweat. A little bit of color on my garlic. And the butternut squash goes in. 
Now I'm going to add a little bit more butter, just a little bit more butter, give it something to saute that squash in. We're going to add an apple. Now apples, you could use the skin, you're going to puree the whole thing, there's lots of vitamins in the skin. I only use skins if, I, if I'm going to have an organic apple. Um, if I have a conventional apple, I'd rather um, get rid of whatever, they're, whatever they've sprayed on the outside of it. Just give these guys a quick peel. When you're doing your knife work, right, hold your knife still and move the apple. Right? That's the safest way to do it. You just turn the apple to your knife, right, really slowly and deliberately. Take your time and, 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 and learn how to do these things. Okay. And you just look, it tells you where to go. Boom, boom. Take your knife. Now the pieces don't matter what size they are exactly because they're going to get pureed. So the apples go in. Right? And before I cut, I tasted this apple and it was wonderful, but I was looking for some tartness, so I used a Granny Smith. The Granny Smiths are really tart. Right before I give these about 15 minutes, I'm going to add a toasted spice rub. Now this toasted spice, this has some chili, some cinnamon, fennel, and coriander and salt. They're all toasted together in a saute pan, and all we do is put them in the blender. And that cinnamon is an amazing flavor that goes with that apple, and I use a good amount of spice here. I want the spice flavor to roast in with everything else and not be you know, so sharp on the front of my tongue. This is going to take about 15 minutes to saute up together and get some nice color. You see this, if you look inside the pot, I'm just getting some light caramelization on these butternut squash and the apple. And the fragrance in this thing, that's that hug that I'm talking about, that the entire house fills up with it. Now you could just roast these, throw these in the oven, and serve these as a side vegetable with a roasted chicken, a pheasant, uh, a pork tenderloin, whatever they are, they are wonderful. But I'm, I'm going to show you some techniques and you can stop and, and use them at various points of the recipe, all right? I have some chicken broth in here. I'm going to grab a big twist of sage here. You don't have to worry about chopping these. We're going to puree this soup anyway. The sage goes in. It's going to add a little bit of fragrance. This is going to simmer for about 15 minutes until everything gets tender. We're going to give it a quick puree, and then the fun begins. Now, when you're blending things like this, always start your blender on low. Now if you wanted to, and you like a little cream and things like this, you could have put a little mascarpone, a little sour cream, milk. But in my case, I think the flavor is so rich onto itself and so silken. Now, as a soup, it's fantastic. Okay? With a pork chop as a sauce, it is unbelievable. What we have here is a wonderful center cut pork chop. You can see how lean and wonderful these are. I'm going to season these with a little bit of salt and some of that same toasted spice rub that we used. The salt on both sides. Mm. When you're seasoning anything that you're sautéing, be sure to give it a liberal seasoning. Half of this is going to come off in the pan and we're going to use a little bit in the sauce to finish anyway. A little bit of extra virgin olive oil. When that begins to smoke, we're going to put the pork in. Now, when you're doing things like this, set your meat in the pan very deliberately and leave it the heck alone. We want it to caramelize. Okay, pork goes in. All right, there we go. Let's take a look at this guy. Oh, that is perfect. Colder it is, the more caramelization we want. Pork gets turned over. Now we're going to take these apple pieces. We're going to throw them right in the pan. 
to roast with the pork. Some of the apple flavor is going to go through and certainly some of that pork schmaltz is going to go on there. Boom, into a 450 degree oven. These are perfect. Oh, I love using the oven as my partner. On things like this, it just speeds up the cooking so much more and you get caramelization from both the top of the pork chop and the bottom at the same time. Look at those. The apples are good. I'm take a little bit of that pork schmaltz and go right over the top. And now we're going to pull this sauce together. Now this is easy as can be. What we have in the bottom of this pan, you see all these pieces? They look like burned. You might be tempted to get another pot because it looks like it's burned. No, that, that's flavor there. We want that flavor there. The first thing we're going to do is we take a few sage leaves and in they go. Sage is going to go in. We're going to add a little bit of apple cider vinegar. Now the vinegar, I always talk about cooking in layers. So this first layer, the vinegar is going to pull everything off the bottom of the pan. And as we cook the vinegar down, the acid's going to get more and more mild. We're going to add a little bit of apple cider right into this. Season that with a little bit of salt and pepper and just reduce it for about 30 seconds. In goes a little bit of the soup. I need about three ounces for each person. I'm going to give it a good spoon together. Oh, God. This rocks. All right. We take our platter. Sauce goes down first. You see how silky that is? Oh. Save a little of that extra for the chef, a little piece of bread, and I am in heaven. Pork chops come over. Mmm. A couple of the extra apples in and around. Now with this, I'm looking for one other flavor. I'm looking for something that's a little sharp and contrasty at the same time never being able to leave well enough alone. We're going to take a little chiffonade radicchio, cut the core out a little bit. Now for the soup, this can be made ahead and actually this is a fantastic freezer soup. You make a gallon of this, you throw it in little cork containers, put it in the freezer and you're a hero when you come home at 9 o'clock at night and haven't had supper. Soup goes in. Now there's a trick in Italy they use for things like this. We keep talking about this sweet and sour and tart enrich. All right, so we're going to take a couple drops of olive oil, a little bit of the toasted spice over the top of that, and then we're going to take now a couple of amaretti cookies. These little almond cookies right on top of these are incredible. These little amarettis are a little pleasant surprise. If you didn't have any cookies like this, you could put a little biscotti or you could reach into the raisin jar. Right, grab a handful of golden raisins. Sprinkle them on top. That same sweetness is doing what we're talking about. It's adding to the texture and the flavor of what we're doing. I love doing shows like this because it gives me a chance to do what I think I do best, is I build flavors. We got a chance today to build not only some flavors in our corn soup, and we did a corn soup by itself. We did a corn soup with the with the toasted fennel spice, scallops were just incredible, and a little watercress salad, butternut squash turned into two wonderful different dishes, both the pork chop with some roasted apples and the chiffonata radicchio and an amazing soup. But most importantly, when you invite somebody over for dinner, you're entertaining. You want them to be entertained. Those are food memories. Those are the food memories that we taste for the rest of our lives. Things like this that I saw and experienced as a kid, every time I begin to cook them the second time myself, I get a chance to relive that memory. And that taste while I'm cooking is just incredible. I love soups like this. You grab a piece of bread. Ah, oh, who needs a spoon? The only thing you need is something to drink with soup. Now, Wine and soup to me is weird. People ask me all the time, what should I have with my minestrone? It's nothing, not, nothing with a minestrone. It's a liquid with a liquid, but with a bisque like this, a butternut squash and apple bisque, 
sherry, sherry, dry sherry is the most amazing combination. Because it's a fortified wine and it's been aged for a lot longer, it's really rich and intense in flavor and the fortification with some alcohol really gives it the punch that you need to push right through the roasted butternut squash and apple flavor. Incredible. Michael Chiarello's Napa is funded by... Sunkist, fresh citrus taste. Cooking with Sunkist throughout the day. Sunkist, our promise, your inspiration. By Salton, innovative products for a healthy today and tomorrow. Bringing you the family of George Foreman's lean, mean, fat-reducing grilling machine. Salton, the secret to indoor grilling. And by Wolf, makers of ovens, cooktops, and ranges to fuel a passion for cooking. And by All Clad Metal Crafters.